If you look at a lot of pitch decks, it's a lot about product and uh, uh, futures and uh, what is novel and et cetera, et cetera. Or uh, within larger corporations, it's about feasibility. Can we make it? all these things? It's all relevant. But if you need to sell it in this famous elevator pitch, yeah, you want to say more strategic things like, hey, so, okay, all this operational data that we have gathered in accelerators, how does this translate to Jeroen's point, something of strategic value for these senior people? Why should they open their wallet, basically? And why should they spend time on their busy agenda listening to another pitch, right? So uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a crucial case. We're going to start with a quick presentation uh, from our speakers, but let me just introduce them very quickly. So uh, Misha is the CEO and founder of 10X Growth based out of Amsterdam. So hi, Misha, do you want to give a quick introduction on yourself? Hey guys, thanks for having me. Yeah, so indeed, John, what you said, working for the last uh, ages, it feels like uh, working for large corporations. I've seen many different uh, companies from the in and outside, worked on many different briefs with startups, without startups, internal building, potential acquisitions, investments. So see many things from many angles. Good to be here and, and share some of uh, our experiences uh, and also to really crank up the hit rate huh, of these programs that both parties can benefit. That's the goal. Yeah, it is the goal because the corporates have what a lot of the startups need and the startups have what a lot of the corporates need. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So these are things that can really fuel growth um, across the board. Uh, and then I also want to want to introduce uh, Jerome. So uh, Jerome is a, is a partner um, and product director at Tanex Growth. So Jerome, do you want to give a quick introduction? Yeah, really sure. So again, also thanks for having me. Um, so I have a tech e-commerce background and I, I have been in both worlds, right? So I've been since early 2010s working with startups, helping them with positioning, fundraising, uh, getting acquired. And the last six years, um, mostly been working for the corporate world on the other side, uh, doing the venture building, international scaling, what to acquire, where to invest. Um, yeah, and I think right now what Misha said, it's, it's time to increase the hit rate, right? We've been seeing it from both sides. Uh, it doesn't work, but it does make sense to work together. So we need to fix yep. it. Let's uh, talk about that today. Hundred percent agree, and that's that's why we partner together, and that's why I'd love to. Every time I talk to these guys, I learn a lot about the innards of large corporations, and because I'm always coming from the startup side, right? So these are the guys that I lean on to understand uh, the inner dynamics of how to actually integrate these really fast mobile startups into these large organizations right in a way that that makes sense for both so yeah with that being said uh i know why don't we queue up the presentation here so just as a reminder to everybody for the the agenda i'm going to go through a, a quick presentation here 10 15 minutes or so um, but at any time if you have questions throw them into the chat right because uh, when the presentation's over then we're just going to have a very long q a session it's going to be interactive so throw any questions that you have into the chat and we'll get to them after the talk all right uh, i'll leave it to you guys john you see the screen all good yep all good okay well as you all know uh, um the, the the topic of today is is basically that a lot of initiatives are, are started within corporations um, they're very serious about innovation uh, a lot of time money is spent on, on doing it right uh, but at the same time we also see that it doesn't lead to the return of investment that is ambition right and that's for acquisitions as john mentioned but also for internal venture building programs startup accelerators and everything that is uh, coming across. So it's really time to rethink strategies. Um, that will be part of our uh, topic of conversation, but first to set the context, I thought it was good to, to share a couple of uh, key principles. Um, now, as John mentioned, eh, we work for a lot of large companies and what we see and which is normal is that uh, the tendency that a brand or product starts to decline is just a matter of time. And what you see there is, is a central theme in, in our thinking is what we call the growth gap. So if a product line is declining um, and we need to create shareholder impact, uh, that means there's a gap between what the core business can produce now and what we should bring in the future. And that core gap, um, that growth gap is a core concept we will dive a bit more into. 
um, because that's one of our key learnings that, that we need um, to address to, to make programs successful. Now, I think most of the people are familiar with the horizons of innovation, but horizon one is, is optimize existing products, <clears throat> making it more efficient. Horizon two is, is jumping with, with our assets and, and, and advantages as a corporate in adjacent markets. And horizon three is more transformative or breakthrough innovations. Um, now, what we know is that Horizon 1 and 2 innovations, they deliver uh, a steady growth and it's, it's the engine of today um, for the cash. But in longer term uh, future, you also need to work on breakthrough innovations. Eh? And that's also because consumer demands are changing. Demographic uh, changes are happening in society. So we need to future proof our core business. And for us, this is also exactly a super interesting space where young companies bring new technologies in that, uh, that can really be of benefit for corporations' core business. Now, at the same time, what we see is that um, there's actually a couple of scientific studies uh, being done to corporate venture building life cycles. I didn't know it was actually a term before I saw the studies, but just to explain you a bit, it goes... It, all of, it also follows the same pattern. So there's a need to innovate, to do it better, to do it faster, to do more consumer-centric innovation, uh, to be more agile, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then there's an enthusiasm to start working on initiatives, um, uh, let's say, that, that help us speed up this innovation. Um, and it's about learning. It's about exploring. And then in year three, uh, people start to ask, well, what's actually the return on investment of all these initiatives? And this is a cycle coming over and over again. Um, so we're now sort of in the cycle again that a lot of larger companies are closing their innovation labs. And it doesn't mean that they don't need to innovate, right? But the conclusion is most of the time, well, we've put a lot of time and effort into many projects. And if we look at the end, yeah, what really came out of it is just not enough that justifies these types of large investments. And innovation labs, per definition, bring also more tensions on the agenda of senior management yeah, because yeah, it's new initiatives. They're small, uh, they're different than the core business, they're uncertain, and nobody really knows if it will become the next big thing. It takes a lot of time to, to bring some real cash back. Um, even more disturbing uh, for larger companies is that it can be margin dilutive. Yeah? So we can uh, create the best new product that is completely on trend, but still it, it will dilute my existing margins. And then the last uh, challenge is that to really new, to really get new innovations in market, we need to invest in new capabilities because the more you move from your core business, the less capabilities you have. Now, for the ones that are familiar with uh, organizational theory, uh, there is Carl Weick who came up with, um, let's say, a definition of, of challenging problems. And he calls them wicked because a wicked problem is not something you can solve. There's not an end solution that sort of miraculously, as a miracle, helps you solve the problem. It's more attention uh, that you need to manage. And that's a very different uh, perspective because the tension will always be there, so it will not go away. And the things that Jeroen and I have this uh, experienced, discovered, and, and written down are a couple of things. So the first one is that a corporate is a large company with uh, a big revenue, um, so they want to have big innovations with large returns fast. And so we need to deliver something big, but the time frame is short. It will not be the first time that we have heard both, like um, there's a growth gap of 400 million or 500 million, and we need to solve that within X amount of years, three, four, five years max. So where do we find the 500 million? Um, and then you can imagine that if we look for such large numbers that puts immense pressure on innovation, which leads to the second almost syndrome, you can call it, it's too big to fill. Yeah? So in order, to get resources allocated to new initiatives, we need to create a big business case with large numbers, 
which requires large investments. Because why, as a corporation, would you invest in small initiatives? Um, well, we have the core that is big and brings a lot of cash in today. Um, the only problem with this is that it's very hard to pull the plug uh, from a large investment. And for the startups, of course, that really practice lean startup uh, and, and, and apply principles of metered funding. Um, yeah, that's basically our sanity check to, to stop before it becomes too big. And we don't know if there would be any return. So this is something also a wicked uh, uh, pattern that, that comes by. Then number three is we want to be disruptive, uh, but we want to build it ourselves. And that has a bit to do with the idea that um, uh, there's a lot of competition out there. We would like to ideally build it internally because there we can more con uh, there we can have a better uh, sense of secrecy in, in that sense. Um, but the problem is that if you build everything yourself or try to do that internally, you automatically um, fall into the, the paradox of number one, is that if you build a new business from scratch, you can't deliver 500 million in three years. Well, if you can, that would be fantastic, but the chance is still quite small. Um, and next to this, um, the consideration of um, partnering with startups uh, or investing smaller amounts in startup is not always on the table. So what you see that is happening is there are large M&A deals, like really large M&A deals, which you all can read about in the paper. And that has to do with the fact that uh, the M&A team has limited resources, so they can only focus on the large things, basically follows the same pattern, um, or we build it internally. Now, number four, um, it's difficult to forecast, right? So innovation is great. Breakthrough innovation uh, is also great, but even more uncertain because it's difficult to forecast or even benchmark it with, with something that already exists. And what we see that is happening then is that early adopter traction. Yeah? So we need to find the people that are really looking for um, a solution uh, for a problem they have. Um, the data can look fantastic for early adopters. Yeah? They love the product, uh, they convert to buying consumers, etc. cetera. Um, but it doesn't mean that that is a mainstream adoption. So one of the things that we see with, with early stage initiatives can be internal, can be a startup, is that um, if you want to move from early adopters to mainstream, you probably need to change something in your product positioning price or channel. Um, now, and that is always also a problem. And what is happening then is that if we mistake early adoption traction for mainstream adoption, uh, a large corp corporation is probably investing too early in a product. Because again, um, we need to bring big numbers. So if we are on a trend for early adopters, we can never deliver these big numbers on a longer time frame. Number five is that innovation is often disconnected from the business growth strategy. And so if I have a core business with a couple of major brands and I've calculated with my team, like, look, I need to bring this 500 million within X amount of years. Um, and we have ideas how to get there. We need to recruit new audience. We need to create new products. We need to enlarge our distribution, et cetera, et cetera. How does innovation help with that? And, and the work that you and I are doing is really connecting um, the innovation uh, concepts, ideas, and we plot it into that business growth strategy so that it's not so isolated. And, and what we see happening in practice is that innovation starts uh, sometimes bottom up, great ideas, well intended, but how does this fit the larger narrative, the larger brand or growth strategy? So this is something to, to be cautious about. And the last point has a bit to do with the, with the cycle of enthusiasm, uncertainty, and disappointment about corporate venture building. What I've seen in general is that emotions are really underestimated within innovation processes, especially um, um, uh, for, for people within a large cor corporation that... Um, are less um, established, let's say, to deal with the uncertainty. Yeah? As, as founders, uh, we know that, um, uh, that we know how to deal with uncertainty, though I think the conversation can be more uh, around this. But can you imagine that if you have never um, 
worked in such an environment that you constantly are surprised by new data, assumptions are failing, experiments don't work out, your stakeholders are looking at you uh, in a sense of uh, when can we expect something of meaning. Um, and that all also interferes with the hierarchy you have in corporations. So it's it's a I always have a lot of respect for the people that do this because it's not a simple thing to do. Um, and there is an interesting saying that uh, a startup needs to win in the market, which is already a battle by itself, as we know. But a corporate startup needs to win in the market, but also internally. And so they basically fight a, a dual front uh, battle. Now, these patterns, uh, they don't go away, but they need to be managed. Yeah? So I think that's an important thing to repeat. Now, as a result, um, and this can be a typical portfolio analysis of uh, an incubator or a large accelerator, is what you basically see is that there are a lot of projects in small markets which are delivering uh, small revenues for a large corporation. Coming back to that growth gap, as said, what do we need to deliver in terms of growth to meet board and investor expectations? And what we need to understand as a startup or as an internal venture, we need to understand how is this category growing? Um, how fast is this growing? Um, what is the churn rate of, of, uh, of, of consumer switching products or going to different categories? This growth gap really serves for us as an understanding to say, well, if we need to come up with the 500 million, we need to do our due diligence upfront to understand that the opportunities that we pursue can be big enough by itself. So we need to change the narrative. Um, so therefore we collaborate together, as mentioned, uh, we call it investment building, a new way for corporates to onboard new technology with skill and timing. Three main ingredients. So first of all, the imagination premium. It's an interesting concept uh, by Rita McGrath, but basically it's a metric that tells us how confident is the investment community in your company's growth strategy. Now, if you then look at a corporation with core assets, uh, we really need to understand, um, are we entering uh, a new market with our innovation? Are we recruiting the newer generation to our category? Um, are we regaining market share from competition? So it's basically a couple of things that we need to measure to understand, well, you know, um, this growth strategy really makes sense and we see the first results coming to life. Number two, uh, acquire strategic positions. Yeah, so, of course, we can do large deals, but in fast-growing terrains, yeah, we would like to explore maybe in a different way that we say, look, we're going to do a smaller investment uh, with a young company in that domain. We're going to explore how fast we can grow uh, and how our uh, assets can play a role into that. So can we future-proof our assets if we bring our as a corporate assets to the table and combine it with the startup? Can we grow faster? Um, so these are important things to take into account. Last but not least is the buy-build-hold mentality that really um, yeah, allows us to manage growth within the timelines you need. Because if we see that a trend is not picking up in a specific market or it's not growing fast enough, then we know already maybe it's not the, t the right time for a corporation to jump uh, into this trend and build new products around it. Now, we execute in three steps. So basically what we want to understand, uh, consumer pain, so very, very the things that are very basic, but consumer pain points, market numbers, um, assessing the growth gap of the company, understand the assets that the corporation has. And, and based on this precision work, we're going to look for companies that can match in terms of consumer pain points, but also in size and futures, and especially in size. Because if we need to bring up the 500 million, that means that per definition, we're not going to look for companies below Series A. So that's sort of the, the first due diligence. Then we are looking for the right companies. That's what we call match. Uh, and of course, then you validate. Uh, it's basically, can we, um, by partnering together, uh, can we tackle a couple of key risky assumptions? And if all these things are successful, you would like to integrate. Now, we will dive deeper into that in the conversation. Last but not least, so why investment building? As said before, it's the new way 
for corporates to keep onboarding new technologies and consumers with the right timing. Uh, innovation matters, but only to future-proof core assets for a corporation, in our opinion. Timing and skill conflict in making internal innovation successful. Uh, as a startup or as an internal innovation, we are always competing for the same resources and finances. We need to have the buy-build-hold mindset uh, to grow with the right timing. Collaboration with mature enough startups will become key for execution for the growth roadmap as it allows us to explore the potential of unknown territories quickly without risk and see if we need to buy assets in order to future-proof the core business. And to sum it up, um, investment building is a methodological way to strategize, validate, and execute on breakthrough innovation initiatives. That was it from my side as an introduction. I have this on the web. That was awesome. Thank you, Misha. We got a lot of great questions here in the chat. I know a lot of people, most of the webinars we run, a lot of people are asking if you'll get the recording. You will get the recording. We can share the slides as well, right, Misha? We'll get a PDF going on this. Sure. Um, but keep the questions coming. Uh, my team is, is putting them into the flow here because there's just a lot to digest, all right? I think, at least me coming from the startup world, a lot of this is pretty novel to be honest with you. Um, and it's just, it's, I, I think the, the biggest dichotomy, right, and Misha, you, you've explained this to me before, is that it all breaks down to there's a small organization versus a big organization and all of the millions of tensions that are created between those, those two things, right? That's literally what it breaks down to. So, you know, it's like, for a lot of those things that you would think that some of those things could be solved when the corporations are just starting to get matched or starting to engage, right? And Jerome, I, I know you, you have some thoughts about this as well, like just starting to engage with the startups where, you know, in, even in a lot of times, it's not the right companies that they're engaging, right? Which, which to me just seems so terrible because it's literally step one. No, I, I think you're right. It's, I think from experience, I, I see two things happening. So one, um, there's not a clear enough picture of what we need. Right? And, and the example I always use is the, um, you see big corporates buying brands, right? But usually those brands are small and they cater towards say early adapter audience. And the bigger corporates have the mass market, right? So when you merge them together, right, it's, it's, it's not, Automatic that it will grow. Right? Most of the people buy smaller brands because they hate the bigger brands. Right? So it's kind of a um, human nature to to not adapt. Right? So you you buy the brand, but you don't think it through with what it will mean. And the other part is that if you work together as a corporate, you need to know what the outcome is. Right? So I usually see that we start working together. We need to learn, uh, but there's no intent. Right? If you want to buy, they want to learn, they want to copy. Just be honest up front. And that also that automatically then also leads to kind of a decision making. How do I want to engage? How far do I want to push it? Um, it's, it's just an honest view in a mirror on how you want to engage, right? It's, it's, it's no better way to describe it, but it's 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 not fun. And right? I've been in so many of these accelerators where um, the corporate says to a startup, "I will give you all the data you can build," and the only thing I think then is then they just want to copy it, right? You just build. They will look right. at it and they will then rebuild themselves. Right? And that's not a fair game in the startup exactly. world. Where you, you buy to grow, you buy to get acquired, and a corporate just needs to understand that it's also their responsibility to play that game in that sense. Yes, that is the biggest um, apprehension from the startup side, right? It's yeah. just saying, okay, I'm going to engage with this corporate. They want data. They're really trying to get a deep dive on my company. Um, where at the same time, maybe they're not, they're not my direct competitor, right? But whatever this niche that I'm focused on is like part of their whole big. If, if you're a small startup, you look at it and a corporate comes to you, you think, hey, that's an additional revenue stream, right? It will generate yeah. my cash flow for the next 18 months. So you put a lot of effort in. And if it then it doesn't happen, so you, you do deliver, but it doesn't happen. It, yeah, it's a disappointment. And I think that's the. And what Misha presented is the 
On the other side, corporates need startups to explore these new territories without risk. And so if you match those two together, there's a common pattern that makes sense, but how to combine it, right? That's kind of the, the challenge. Um, and I think that with corporate venture building as is, that's why the labs are closing, it stays too small, it never gets big, or it just stays exploring. Um, but if you look at it from an investment approach, right, it, it becomes serious. We get in there to acquire, and we need to understand the problem to also understand what do we need need to acquire, and then it changes the um, yeah the narrative, but also the mindset of those corporates because they do know how to spend money, just where where to apply. It. And I think Misha, you brought up too, right? It's just these dichotomies, like the the large corporations have big ambitions and they want to get done fast. Correct. But in a lot of cases, they're or you could even say in most or almost all cases, their corporations are not set up to act on opportunities very, very quickly, right. uh, which is why <laughs> they set up innovation labs and why they engage with startups, right? And um, so we all understand the why, but it's kind of the how is where things start to, things start to fall apart, yeah. right? So where are, you know, just outside of, yeah, startups are meant to move quickly. They iterate quickly. Um, and the, the companies that are sort of thinking more in horizons, but then in order to reach some of those horizons, they need to move quickly, right? Just some of the ways that they're failing. And, you know, I think at a, a larger question is just, yeah, just some of those other uh, patterns that you're seeing as to, you know, when startups are being matched or being put into these innovation programs with large corporations that literally right off the bat, you could say, that's not going to work. Yeah, so yeah, a couple of things, right? Um, first of all, I guess that um, if you have a very good understanding of, of how to grow your own business, right? So if you, if you sort of analyze your own sales data and you understand, look, this is how we have grown in the past, um, and, and now sort of we can forecast what we should do in the future. Yeah? So where are our growth opportunities in the future? And, and, under, and understand um, what's behind. Then we can also... Uh, scout very successful for young companies that probably see the same type of problems, but then from their perspective, um, yeah, but, but, but th there it already starts. So do we have a very good understanding of the opportunity space that we are playing in? Um, and what can we bring as a corporation that brings us an unfair advantage? Because we have brands, right? We have distribution, we have cash, uh, we have a lot of smart people, et cetera, et cetera. So, it starts already with the scoping of the opportunity space, um, which is actually step one in our process, right? Um, yep. To then, to then be, be really precise with the type of companies that we are looking for, and and you then look at most of the um, startup accelerators, um, where also corporations are being invited, and what's on stage, um, it's basically too small. Um, uh, for a large company to absorb, eh? because you already mentioned, yeah, this dichotomy between big and small, that's super real. Because I can have, uh, I can find super great companies out there, but I can already tell you upfront that can't be sold internally, right? Because there's another complexity, right? Is that you and I can do business together and you make a decision, great. But within a larger company, there are, of course, more people that need to have uh, an understanding of what to do and, and sort of give the approval. And so they also need to sell it internally. Um, and that's where things get more complicated because, yeah, you can have the best idea, great AI startup. But yeah, um, it will never impact our top line in any way. So why would I spend money into that? We can just wait and buy a large one, right? That's... From what, from what I've seen there too, Misha, is that a lot of our B2B founders kind of, they understand that concept, right? Of look, when you're working with a corporation, whoever you're talking to, not only are you trying to sell that person, but you're trying to give them, equip them with the ability to sell what you're doing internally to their higher ups, to their higher ups, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but when it comes to a lot of consumer focused businesses, they don't think that way because they, typically don't have to think that way, right? But when they are working and trying to partner with large corporations, they have to think that way because that's the only way that it'll it'll go up the value chain, right? Yeah, uh, absolutely. It's it's a lot of 
uh, understanding of how how it internally works um, and, and and develop the relationships, understand where you are on their agenda, and and what can I do to make that a bit higher priority, right? So it's really your own B two B customer development process, right? To sort of figure out how is the sales process going internally, who are the key stakeholders, where am I with my topic on their agenda. And that all also leads to a lot of interesting insights because if we're not on their agenda, why is that? Uh, probably not because they don't find it interesting, but there are potentially other reasons, right? So right. Um, I think that's good to investigate. And yeah, when, when it comes maybe, to... Oh, God. Sorry, th I just want to add to that. I think uh, this is what we discussed, right? So, the, so there's a difference between I want to grow something from 100 to, let's say, a billion in five years or i want to double my revenue in a year from now right so and if i want to do the last one double it that means that i need to look at startups at a different size right so right i can double it but they, they need to have let's say 20 30 million annual turnover for me to double it at that size if i have five to six years it can be smaller right but but if we treat everything like small because it needs to be inventive it doesn't match those timelines. So from a corporate perspective, that also then aligns to where to look for, what's the size, what's the outtake. And from a from a startup perspective, right, working with these corporates, right, so you just need a separate team. I've, I've been on the sideline with those startups enthusiastic, but it, yeah, it just needs a dedicated team to work the corporate alone that distracts from your uh, from your own business. Right. So just so you need to be smart or at a certain stage where you have the yeah, you have more, more than one salesperson. You need to be beyond the founder doing sales. You need a sales team, a customer success team, et cetera, just to put some people dedicated on the corporate, just to make it work, right? So there's uh, sizing, right. there's a maturity, there's a revenue stage. All those things are need to be considered to make it applicable for the cases that Misha mentioned, right? So I need to grow, how much? Right now, can it be in two years? It's, it's a, just a difficult situation if we don't understand that from both sides. So one of the things that really like kind of triggered me just, you know, working with so many startups and seeing it from our side in a lot of these situations is that I think, yeah, this failure happens in, in a lot of these first stages, right? So, and it's probably, you could do some pretty simple math. So as a corporation, right, let's say that you have, all right, I have, I need to increase sales by $500 million in three years or something. Right. And they maybe they're sharing that with startups when they start to engage with them. Maybe they're not. They probably should. Right. Um, but even if they're not sharing that with startups, what does that mean? If they want to hit five hundred million dollars in three years, like what are the types of startups that they should be starting to engage? Because we see a lot of situations where they're engaging with startups at, at not at the right stage, it's wasting their time. It's wasting the startups time. You know, it's, it's a it's a huge net negative. Yeah, so it goes multiplying the assets, right? But this give so we're have a huge experience in the food industry where it usually takes from zero to five years to get 100 million. So if I need to double in two years, for example, to get the access, I need to have started that that's that's at year three of maturity. Because otherwise I don't have time to grow with my assets. And then you're at kind of these uh, I do 30, 50 million turnover a year, which means valuation is to 300 at current rates, etc. Uh, right, so that's then what I need to look for. If right, if I have um, five to ten years to grow, I could look at smaller um, startups and I can make more bets, but I can also treat them better. So it's kind of in that stage that determines where to look at um, right. and how to look. And, and what Misha mentioned, but the, the thing is, if you look at the S, for example, Unilever has the best footprint in terms of sales outlets. So if I pick something that works really well, I already have my hundred million because I just scale it simply. Yeah. Right? It's, it's kind of that's all in the multiplier we need to look at. Yeah, but in general, it's, it's 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 this where we first start to plot, and we limit we so we eliminate small ones, we eliminate the really big ones, and this is our niche: thirty to fifty million turnover, and can we grow that? For example, as in this case. Uh, what you said, Jeroen, I mean, the huge distribution power that a large company sometimes can bring to the table, yeah, that is that that can be played out in both uh, advantage, but then, indeed, is the product tailored to that specific uh, channel, 
um, what does it take to tailor it to that? So it becomes, so you're sort of also trying to re-engineer what would actually fit and work, right? And, and I think that's that's the interesting perspective. So how can that fit um, their assets with my product? What do I need to change in that to make that fit? These are the, the right type of questions to, to run POCs on, for example. Yeah. Yeah, and, and so what we discussed in our approach is that right, so we, we do matchmaking and then the middle part is the validation is where yeah. we intend to give a startup funding. Let's say it's, there's 50,000 euros of marketing funding just to prove that we can scale the product. Uh, and if you can prove it as a startup, there's money at the end. Right? It could be a partnership, a contract, it could be m a if you want to, but right, it's, it's kind of a reverse methodology to prove it without interfering with the sales standards of, of startup, but it's kind of this proof where we, we select it in the right way and can we multiply to prove it? And then the next step is there all, also, uh, we continue. Yeah, it, it makes, it makes sense. Solution. Yeah, it makes total sense to me. It's just frustrating that a lot of these mismatches just happen so early on. So I, I want to start uh, wrapping in some audience questions here. So John from uh, from Raleigh, if you guys don't know, Raleigh is a, a, a city here in the United States. But uh, John wants to talk to about this intention problem. So, you know, what he says is innovation is too often the enterprise thought is IP, right? It's thought of invention, new invention. Um, and, you know, there is also this dichotomy where founders are going to be afraid of sharing this intention, this information, this IP with third parties. Um, you know, so what is like how, and, and I guess this this boils down to, you know, the, the, the key to a good innovation program for a corporation is to make sure that you are doing it in a way that will not hurt a startup in the long term, right? Um, but even from the outset, it's to make sure that um, even the most interesting startups, when they see what you're trying to do, don't just get turned off, right? Because they are, they need to move quickly. They're, they're getting emails every day from people and they're saying, yes, yes, no, no, yes, yes. Um, so yeah, like how, how have you seen large corporations kind of tackle that problem where it's basically getting over the hump of saying, like, hey, are you just a corporate that is trying to steal my IP? get all the labor of my hard work and then throw it into your corporate machine and make make a billion dollars off of it right yeah look um so i think first of all what is the, um i've seen many different ideas and sometimes there's some real some real novel uh, technology for example um and, and sometimes uh, uh, there's too much tendency to sort of uh, uh, be overhyped about an idea huh? um, and so I think if, if you have a real novel technology then then I would think twice first of all to do I really need uh, this corporation or another partner to work with huh? so I think that's sort of a serious uh, question to start with um, and what I also sometimes see in, in in practice is that there's not a real good negotiation process right so is that both sides of the table do not really uh, um, uh, uh, so it's easy to avoid uh, the tensions and the conflicts uh, potential that can be happening in these conversations. So I think it's also that if you really have something novel, um, yeah, first have uh, good negotiations about it, right? And uh, make clear contracts and agreements. Uh, and it sometimes is being um, uh, not done very properly. Um, do you think that's a big so is it like a an mou or even like an nda or something like that i mean is that are you guys is that a normal part of the process that wouldn't put anything at a halt i think uh, it's, it's always difficult to to negotiate a partnership in a contract right? because a contract also has, has liabilities uh, right i think the uh, how, how we usually like to approach this is that we have uh, we convinced the corporate that it's about enhancing their current assets. So it's not about copy pasting, but it's how can we use this to enhance our assets, uh, and then uh, prove from the outside in that it works. So I rather would give the startup a, a incentive, money, contract, etc., but reimburse them for the effort to prove that 
um, that ID resonates with the asset, and then if it does, right, then I will give you X, Y, Z. So it's kind of a an earn in structure, and so and that's something yeah. you can negotiate in the contract. Yeah. And then it's actually just um, a sales quote. Right, so I, I you, wish there was a standard here. Maybe we should try to create one, guys. Yeah, right? we, we like, you know, like, yeah. like the fast agreement, right? Was um, is a standard we created to try to help facilitate really quick uh, founder yeah. and advisor yeah. relationships, right? Um, th there's a lot of agreements out there where, yeah, it's just if it can make everybody feel a little bit more comfortable and get done quickly without the need of a lawyer, right? Standardization. <laughs> Because yeah, in a lot of these cases, like the start, the large corporations, like they're the last thing that they're probably thinking of is, oh, I want to steal this startup's IP, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, so, but it it would, yeah, something quick like that, I think would yeah. would be interesting. No, I think that's so, so. What we do between corporate is kind of we we run an accelerator because yep. an accelerator you're allowed to fail, so the liability is gone, and you're allowed to fail to work together. And so you have one ingredient partner and one brand, and then right, if successful, the brand takes over. That's in the sales quote. Right? But then up front, we agree if this happens, you agree to buy the product and, and launch it in the market. Yeah. Um, yeah. And something similar needs to happen there. So my personal experience when I ran a startup is that I usually turn this into a sales quote, uh, which then got signed. So it's just an assignment we do for 12 months with a, a delivery assignment. So I approve X, Y, Z, and then we get the next contract. Uh, I saw some remarks about intentions. Um, yeah, you just have to be very aware on, on how that happens as a startup. Um, and what Misha mentioned, politics, management, et cetera. But I think the program we offer should fix this for the startup. Because yeah. we, yeah. we know this happens. Um, and we need to create an ecosystem where um, like this 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 can work in a trusted way but agreed right if we can pencil it down and this is a template contract that would be fine um it's it's a great question um, i think we can debate about this for hours but it's it's and uh, it's, i would do the earning earn structure it differs also a bit per company eh? some company really would like to own the ip others feel fine with collaboration and investing um okay. and we met i think you and i met both a lot of smart people in the corporations we worked a lot with them and they uh, um there are also a lot of uh, i would say uh, a lot of people very open to all these new things right but they all sometimes also don't know how to do this right so to your point john i think uh, there's something to uh, to be created yeah yeah let's know yeah. this uh, sure. So, and, and just getting into, you, you know, and this is a question from uh, uh, Granit. Uh, hopefully I'm, I'm saying that correctly. It's uh, from Amsterdam, so close to you guys. Uh, you know, so I know we've talked a little bit about like, what are the, some of the strategies that we can do this, right? So Granit's asking like, what is replacing these innovation labs? Like, what are some of the ways, and I know that we've talked about this a little bit, right? But just replacing these uh, processes so that they can address some of these wicked problems. So we've been sort of going through this step by step, right? Mm -hmm. Like number one, okay, uh, there's this question of intentions. Number two, are the startups like properly matched, and are the companies looking for the properly matched companies in terms of stage and size, yeah. right? And I know we've talked about this, you know, privately before. You guys are pretty adamant in saying that, like. You know, you need to be at least like Series A ish level, right? Before it makes sense, and honestly, that sort of alleviates some of those stealing IP concerns because if, if you're at that Series A level, you've already kind of created an engine of growth, right? Yes. And you've figured out, yeah, it's not a question of like, hey, is their product market fit necessarily? It's a question of like, okay, I'm right now at like five X. How do I get that to a hundred? Right? Yeah. yeah. Correct, and I think the question was about what's what's sort of replacing now the labs, right? If I if I yeah, like the right. So, um, what I've seen and and um, uh, is that um, so if these labs are closing, most of the time it's it's sort of in the frame of uh, we're gonna move it closer to the core business. Yeah? So 
there's always this tendency, do you separate your incubation lab or your innovation lab, right? Do you need to separate it from the mothership? If you do, then sometimes it's too far and people wonder what the hell are they doing there? And yeah, nothing serious comes out of it. Eh? That's sort of the stereotype uh, idea, which I completely understand also if I would be in the shoes of the other person. Uh, if you put it too close in the core, it starts to mingle with all your 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 core business activities, right? And and so, it's it's a, it's a bit of a, a difficult thing. But um, what I see happening now is that they close labs and they bring it more into the core, and then we just need to not we don't know what's coming out of it then, right? What's happening then? We don't know. Um, um, so I don't think I don't know if it's a good way or not a good way. But the problem behind is that. There needs to be more grip on all these dispersed innovation activities within such a large giant, right? So I feel that that's sort of uh, behind it also. Yes, I think, makes uh, sense. Um, so uh, to reiterate, reiterate what Misha says, I think they're, they're moving it back to the core. So the power brands, the core brands, and then yeah. more focus. But the, then the tendency is that they lose sight of the, the, the new technology waves coming up. And I think the, 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 what we try to say with this investment approach, working with startups, I, I truly believe that if we do it right, this will replace the innovation labs yeah. um, and also provide an ecosystem where startups build, grow, get acquired, corporates grow but faster. This will replace that, that, that new technology desire to, uh, to grow faster or make it future proof. Because core assets, a new flavor, a new size, sample, bottle, whatever. Um, that's what they're good at. But finding the next best thing, I think that's where uh, this initiative we're launching right now is, is a big answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And it, it would allow you basically to start engaging with startups in a in kind of a lightweight, structured way early on, yeah. right? Before they get to the point where. Um, where kind of the corporate mach corporate machine may slow them down and and i know like something we've chatted about too is like you know literally when you just dial into like what is the exact stage that that startups should be trying to engage with companies even that simple question seemingly simple right is really complicated because most most large corporations are trying to find kind of disruptive startups Right, which means disruptive technology. They're at a stage when they're still they're they're sort of before the scale stage. They're still like kind of disrupting, right? So they're at a stage where they need to move really, really quickly, which is exactly why the startups or the why the large corporations want to work with them. But then in in partnering with the large corporation, it literally negates in in a lot of ways the speed by which uh, they attracted the large company to begin with, right? Um, it, are there any examples of just, and I, I know this is what we're trying to do here with this partnership, right? But are there, are there any like kind of just methodologies? I mean, I know there's a lot of corp, corporate like venture building methodologies. There's, you know, even like hackathons. I mean, obviously in a, in a much earlier degree, but are there any examples of, of companies or just initiatives that you've seen that, that you think have done it like pretty well? Um, or that at least have, have tried to figure out some concepts there that, that you think can inform what we do in the future? Yeah. Well, I can, I can, I know, um, probably you will uh, come also with his, uh, with the PepsiCo uh, example, which I'll leave to you. Uh, and you probably knows which example I will come with, but, uh, I like the, yeah. um, the, the minority acquisition of uh, Nestle that bought Y food for 49.5%. You can just read it on the internet. Uh, mm -hmm. and uh, it's a mature asset so it delivers it's a mature company so it delivers what is it 100 120 million annual revenue um, it's tailored to specific audience it has of course a specific brand that is tailored to that uh, and their products um, and it's interesting for them also because uh, yeah normally uh, m a buys the whole company right <laughs> um but now, actually, the, the, the idea is, of course, that we buy this this 49.5%. I don't know the exact deal, right? But you can fill in the assumptions is yeah. that, um, well, 115 is great, but 600 is better, right? 600 million. So so the idea is then how can, how can we grow uh, uh, this company 
with all the knowledge uh, and power uh, a large company like Nestle has. And then it becomes interesting for both parties huh? because the founders of Y Food, and then I think every company goes through that curve. Yeah, you will reach a, a, a plateau somehow, right? It's, it's difficult to find that next curve. And I think that is a super interesting moment um, that a large company bring can bring a lot of muscle uh, to the table. So I think this is an interesting example from my side. Because yeah, most, gonna... most companies tend to think about it as all or nothing, right? Not necessarily yeah. in that investment. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. correct. Yeah. I think so the example for why food is kind of ideal because it, you know, the founders can then still prove the, the initial value of the product and then need to show that it works. But a big incentive, of course. I think the so from structural perspective, I, I really like the PepsiCo lab example because they spend a lot of time in their due diligence and have a really close relationship with investing the investment network. Right? So, so in terms of acquisition, they've proven value, which means that investors provide them with the best solutions uh, for an M&A purpose or a partnership. Right. So it's kind of it's an ecosystem they created and that goes both ways. So it's value for startups, value for investors and it's value for PepsiCo. Um, but the key part is they do their due diligence very well. They spend six months on understanding the problem and also understanding, okay, then this is what I need to buy for a perfect match with PepsiCo. Yeah. Um, and I think for, for Nestle, what I also like is that they focus on their R&D lab as owning kind of the, the, the problem of proving value for new IDs, right? from ID to a shelf test. Um, yeah, they, they didn't distribute it in marketing teams and just centralized R&D. Yeah. Build it for us, prove it, and then the country teams will then adopt it uh, as, a, as a mindset methodology for such a large company. That was kind of the, um, I, I do believe, was the, the best fit to, to place it in a company in that sense. Yeah, it's a, just a much more agile, a much more agile mindset right it's like yeah, hey, there's, there's not an immediate business risk it's just prove that it brings value yeah. most of r d they can work with other companies i can use your product i understand how to make it big and let's prove together so it's kind of a no risk um no business commitments i need to have money right now um problem there's always problems but as an example how to place it was i, I think an ideal example um or at least one of the best ones we worked at as a proof of value so I have a, a company here from Cattle and from Bucharest is asking like this mentality of uh, quote unquote, it works before, so it'll work a bit again, right? Yes. We know better, <laughs> right? Yeah. Kind yeah. of pervasive, especially in, in large companies, right? Because yeah. yeah, they've they've been successful, right? That's why they're in this position. So I, I think that dives into a lot of what you guys are talking, just the politics and that kind of stuff. but. You know, it, it is why, like, how <laughs> how have you guys seen it? I mean, literally, you, you guys have done workshops at these companies. You, you've been trying. I, I feel like a lot of what you do is just mindset shifting, right? <laughs> so yeah. how do you get them out of that mindset shift? Because they have a point, right? They are successful. They've built a lot of value. But on the other side, it's just the world changes. Yeah, but I also think, and I didn't... Uh, encounter this mentality too often in my opinion no. uh, in my experience so um but um, but maybe the people that you're working with encounter this mentality when they're uh, always, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. like like in in every large company like every institution with a lot of people um there's a lot of management yep. of egos right so um i think there there's a very interesting perspective which i which i really love myself is uh, we have this um, there's this professor from insiat uh, manfred gets de vries and he wrote a book about the neurotic theater uh, and i think that's sometimes the perspective and glass that you can put on to understand look there's so many tensions and different stakes in one environment um, of course that will lead to tensions that are not outspoken to things that have not been said to feelings that can't be felt and then it in what it does it goes under the ground right so um but i always at least try to do and facilitate different groups of people is um um yeah to start at least try to uh to build this this um 
uh, energy or sphere about people being open eh? uh, and that we try right. to and and things that are not said is the challenge right so we actually need to say the things that are not being said otherwise we don't have the right conversation we don't have the right tension in the conversation which which doesn't lead to great innovation eh? if we don't really have the um, the pushback to each other so uh, Kiran Deep asked, and sorry to interrupt because it's very related, right? Kiran Deep asked, like, that are talking about this leadership to be threatened by innovation, right? Um, it's, and not only leadership, but technology, right? The IT teams, if it's a new technology or things like that, they may see those things as, as threatening as well. So that just sort of compounds this idea. I mean, it's just similar, right? It's like, oh, we know the way to do things. This is how we've always done it. Um, and anything new is not only just questions, okay, well, is this the right thing, the right strategy for our corporation, or is this the right strategy for our team? But it's it's threatening to the leaders and the people that have power because it literally threatens the basis by which they are employed, <laughs> right? Um, right? So, yeah, I guess like, is there, yeah, just thinking a little bit more, and I know we're already talking about it here, right? But just ways that at least to, to equip, because it's usually people are charged with innovation, right? But they're reporting up to people that are managing a lot of different things and innovation a lot of times is thought of as this little satellite thing over here, right? But the key is to start integrating that into the mothership in a way that's meaningful, that can pull budget, and that is seen as you know future proofing the business. So, yeah, and any other strategies you guys have used to really kind of be able to sell those things going up and up and up? Um, yeah. yeah. So the yeah. next to the personal space, I think it's 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 a value based. Right? So the so the higher up you go, um, the more focused they are on on margin. Growth yep. and year over year strategies. Right. So I think the right. only way to overcome it is setting a target. And then Misha mentioned in his presentation growth gap, for example. There will always be a gap if you stretch. Right. So if you grow like 20%, if you grow like 50%, there's a stretch. And then anybody that says in that group, we've done it before, etc., there's this gap that needs to be filled. Right. And if you yeah. in your solution can deliver the promise that you can fill that gap in somehow, some way, there will be kind of a need to explore it because otherwise I don't meet my growth targets. Right? And then we have a different discussion with leadership, but also with innovation teams because suddenly innovation teams become, re become relevant, maybe not today, but in two years from now, there's a gap. Right? For example, in the food industry, they go three to 5% each year, but what if I need to double? So I miss 5% per right. year. I need to acquire, get it somewhere else. So if you fit in that 5% growth, right, at least there is a sense of urgency to explore it. And if they've done it before, show it to me, all right? Or some had to add. So, so I think labeling it not as a solution that fits innovation, but as something that's relevant to growth exactly. year over year, margin, et cetera. Um, all of a sudden you have a different value-based discussion, which also means you can value your innovation differently. So it sounds simple, but thinking yeah, of but it, it's, it, right? It's it's the the way um, a lot of the teams are set up now. It, it's just it's an innovation team, and they're not talking to tech. They're not talking to. And so for us, for example, we don't talk to innovation teams. We talk to a category team or a VP strategy that's responsible for doubling it or tripling it, right? And then, based on that ambition, we can start talking to an innovation team, because then we know what to deliver, right? and then we don't do it the other way around. It's it's just a simple way of. Got we've it. done it before or we're already doing it etc but if you're doing it it's not delivering so where's the gap right so it's kind of a mindset change and i know that it works for me it's kind of killing any sales discussion even in so many meetings where we just present a pitch yeah we've done it before this doesn't happen and we talk with it and it does it um, i think, think of reframing you're, it. you're completely right right i mean i mean and can we show what's in it for them Right. So I think there's a lot of, uh, if you look at a lot of pitch decks, there's a lot about product and uh, futures and uh, what is novel and et cetera, et cetera, or uh, within large corporations about feasibility. Can we make it? all these things? It's all relevant. But if you need to sell it in this famous elevator pitch, yeah, you want to say more strategic things like, hey, so 
okay, all this operational data that we have gathered in accelerators, how does this translate to Jeroen's point, something of strategic value for these senior people? Why should they open their wallet basically? And why should they spend time on their busy agenda listening to another pitch, right? So uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's a crucial case. Yeah. So if it maybe just as a, as a final example. So uh, I, I, I used to run a, uh, own a uh, um, analytics startup, measure. So, and we, we delivered in what we call side speed. So how does it, is it, is it fast enough? Does it work? It's a technical problem. So you talk with IT people. But when we change the narrative, let's say, if um, I can make you 7% more conversion if you're one second faster. There's, there's, there's no e-commerce manager that says no to this. So we just change the narrative and all of a sudden you can sell to everybody. So it's just reframing how you think. And this is the same, same topic. Yeah. You just need to find out how to reframe it so it makes sense for a company in terms of um, value add. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, guys. And honestly, it's it's a lot of and just yeah to close things up here. Like it's it's very analogous to a lot of things that we've seen in the startup space, right? The last ten years or so, where it's all a bit about you know it, it's just growth and and it's like oh well you know it, it's sort of a mentality of just throwing things against the wall and seeing what sticks. Right. Um, and I think on the corporate side, it's just if you were a lot of corporations have just been able to throw a lot of these things under this umbrella of quote unquote innovation, right, which is press releases and things like that. But when it's not actually tied to the, the core metrics and the core business, then that's what it becomes. It becomes theater, right? It yeah. just becomes press releases and you can. You can issue a press release for a lot less than it takes to uh, to launch a whole innovation lab, right? So yeah. Um, it's yeah, it's kind of similar in the in the venture in the startup space where it's just all been about growth and growth and growth and don't worry about actually bottom line yet about actually making a profit. It's just growth, 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 right? And now we're getting to uh, an environment where uh, it's it's yeah, it's being respected a little bit more to create things that are sustainable and that actually have an impact. So um, I, I love hearing these insights, guys. I, I hope, and, and I can see here from the chat as well, that a lot of people have learned a lot too. You know, I, I, I come from the startup space. I live and breathe it. So every time I talk to these guys, I learn more and more just about what are, what are some of the issues as to, you know, how we can help not only the large corporations, but just the companies, right? These are two entities that have value for each other and that want to engage and they just continue to kind of hit these roadblocks so if we can figure this out um and even i think from a brainstorming perspective some kind of standard i don't know term sheet mou whatever you know at least i know from the startup side that would make a lot of people a lot more comfortable mm -hmm. um and you know perhaps from the corporate side as well it would if you can make more startups comfortable, maybe they can even just increase the volume yeah. on their end, yeah. right? Yeah. 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 All right. Well, That's thank you work. so much. Uh, thank you, Jerome. Thank you, Misha, for, for joining. Thanks, everyone, for joining as well. We'll send you a video uh, and the, uh, a PDF as well, the presentation in the next couple of days. Uh, if you are interested in just learning more about what we're doing, you can reply to any of the emails that you receive from us. I know some of them are automated, but if you reply, they all go to the same place. Uh, and in addition, uh, we'll be sending out some links along with the the video in, in a couple of days as well where you can uh, get in touch. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, yes. If you are sticking around. Thank you. We're, there's going to be uh, networking tables as well if you want to uh, to go in there and meet some other people. Cool. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.